I don't know if you noticed, but I have a fondness for any topic related to decision making under uncertainty, when it's studied scientifically, of course. Understanding how and why people make decisions when they don't have all the facts is fascinating to me. That's why I like electoral forecasting and I love cognitive sciences. So, for the first episode of 2021, I have a special treat for you. I had the great pleasure of hosting Michael Lee on the podcast. Yes, the Michael Lee who co-authored the book Patient Cognitive Modeling with Eric Jan Wagenmakers in 2013. By the way, the book was ported to MC3. I put the link in the show notes if you're interested. And this book was inspired from Michael's work as a professor of cognitive sciences at University of California, Irvine. He works a lot on representation, memory learning, and decision making, with a special focus on individual differences and collective cognition. Using naturally occurring behavioral data, he builds probabilistic generative models to try and answer hard real-world questions. How does memory impairment work? That's modeled with multinomial processing trees, by the way. How complex are simple decisions? And how do people change strategies? Echoing episode 18 with Daniel Likens, Michael and I also talked about the reproducibility crisis, how are cognitive science doing, which progress was made, and what is still to do. Living now in California, Michael is originally from Australia, where he did his bachelor's of psychology and mathematics and his PhD in psychology. But Michael is also fond of the city of Amsterdam, which he sees as, quote, the perfect antidote to Southern California with old buildings, public transport, great bread and beer, and crappy weather, end quote. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 31, recorded August 6, 2020. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash stats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo control? science like I'm Richard Feynman is it because of my looks or the fact that I talk like a mad for books either way Michael Lee system. welcome to learning Bayesian statistics thank you it's nice to be here yeah you're welcome thanks for taking the time it's a real treat having you here I really love the topics you're researching and writing on so I can't wait to talk about them but as always, let's start with your story, because it seems to me like you're into math and psychology since at least your bachelor's degree. So how come and what's your story? I'm, I'm curious about that because you seem to have found your true passion since exited high school. Well, true passion is maybe a little bit strong, but I like my <laughs> job and I like what I do. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's a good thing. I was born and raised in Adelaide and... When I went to university at the University of Adelaide, because everybody in Australia stays in the same city that they were born in to go to university, nobody moves around. Ah, really? Yeah, yeah. it's a very Australian thing to stay parochially wherever you were born. So you also do PhD or graduate school at the same place that you're an undergraduate, almost always. That's the normal thing. You know, when okay. I went from high school to university, I just had to catch the bus five more bus stops to get off at where the university was instead of my high school. It wasn't really a <laughs> move. So I did a bunch of subjects because I wasn't sure what I was interested in. I did accounting and math and psychology and 
I forget what else, statistics, I think, and there must have been at least another one in there somewhere. And I kept following my dad's advice of just keep doing things that you're interested in and reasonably good at. And the two that I was interested in good at were math and psychology. And I guess over time, I realized that you could actually combine those two. It wasn't a contradiction in terms that quantitative approaches within psychology had a lot of value. So that's what I ended up majoring in as an undergraduate. And I did an honors year in psychology and then did a PhD in psychology. But I also had an advisor from electrical and electronic engineering for the sort of quantitative part. I was very lucky, even though, you know, Adelaide is at the edge of the world and not the intellectual hub of very much. My supervisor was Douglas Vickers in psychology, who was, you know, international caliber, highly regarded perceptual psychologist who did modeling work. And I had a good advisor from electronical and electric engineering as well. So I did a PhD. And, and then after that, I went to was then called the Defense Science Technology Organization. So it's Australia's Department of Defense, and it's their research group. I think it's called something else now. And I spent about five years there doing okay. applied research for the intelligence analysts who work within that community. And that was really a formative thing for me. It got me very focused on research research that was impactful and useful and based upon real world problems, I think. But at some point there, somebody showed me a graph of the probability you would retire in that organization as a function of how many years you'd already been working in the organization. And basically, after seven years, it was 100% probability you'd hit terminal velocity, you were going to retire there because you're doing all this classified work that you couldn't publish, you'd become very useful to them, but not useful to the external world. Yeah. And I thought, I'm a little young to commit to this for my entire life. So I went back to the University of Adelaide in 2001 as a professor professor doing research and teaching. And then in 2006, I moved to Irvine because it's a really strong place for the stuff I'm interested in. And just independently, I wanted to live in the US rather than Australia. And I've been at Irvine ever since in the cognitive sciences department. Okay. So one thing I'm curious about now is, would you be closer to Adelaide if you were living in Europe or where you're living now? Because now you're like super far from Adelaide, right? Am I mistaken or not? No. So I'm about halfway between Europe and Australia, I think. They both take about an equal amount of time and effort to get there. Yeah. It may be that Australia is a little further, but all you have to do is go up to LAX and catch one flight and you're in Australia. Europe can Getting to Europe can be a little more complicated. <laughs> and having been brought up in Australia, this might sound funny, but I was delighted to get to California because now Europe was suddenly so close. You know, it was only kind of... 15 hours instead of 40 hours like it used to be. Yeah, I get that. Actually, we could talk about that. But I think I invited you here to talk about cognitive sciences. So first, I already had some guests working cognitive sciences like Chunpeng Lao and Thomas Vicky. But can you define cognitive science for us and what is its main topics and its main characteristics? Yes, that's an interesting question. And I do really think of myself as a cognitive scientist rather than a psychologist. In fact, at Irvine, there are two psychology departments. There's psychological sciences, which I'm not in, cognitive sciences, which I am in, and they're separate things. So for me, the key difference is the multidisciplinarity of cognitive science. The fact that it's yeah. it's not just cognitive psychology or new cognitive neuropsychology. It involves aspects of computer science, like artificial intelligence and machine learning, core neurobiology, statistics is an important discipline, philosophy, anthropology, game theory. So there's really a focus, I think, on intelligence or intelligent systems. And of course, studying humans and people is one core component of that because we're a great example of an intelligent system. But it, I don't think that should be the restriction. I think what makes cognitive science different and interesting is what you can learn from all of those other disciplines, all the types of things you can study if you're interested in intelligent systems. You know, it suddenly means that exactly how the brain does it might not be the front and center question anymore. You're interested in what it means for a system to behave intelligently, however it happens to be implemented. So that's how I think of cognitive science. And that's certainly how the department I'm in and the intellectual environment I'm in works multidisciplinary in that way. Yeah, that sounds super interesting. And yeah, as you say, super broad and applied topics. So it's something I'm quite sensitive to. 
And actually, something that's also striking to me is that you do also a lot of statistical work in the sense that a lot of your work is like statistically heavy and there are a lot of different models and methods that you use. So I'm curious because you said that you consider yourself a cognitive scientist uh, more than a psychologist. But now I'm wondering whether you would say you're more on the statistics side of things or more on the applied side of things or maybe on both. Maybe on neither either. I mean, I didn't set out to be a methodologist in any way. I was interested in intelligent behavior and you know, how knowledge is represented, how decisions should be made, how learning and adaptation should happen, variability like individual differences. These are the things that I still find the most interesting and that motivated me the most. But to answer them, you need to have methods that you think are satisfactory. And so if you look around and you think running 20 undergraduates and doing a t-test isn't a good way to answer these questions, then quickly you have to dig methodologically deeper. So I think, you know, what in work that I do or in the work that people like me do, it's often methodologically interesting, but I don't think we're doing it because we want to be methodologists or we want to publish new results in statistics journals necessarily. I think we see the need for these tools as ways to answer the questions that we're interested in. And sometimes this can be frustrating, right? You get these things where if people see a paper that has unfamiliar methodology, they think it must be a methodological paper. And yeah. I don't think that's true. Sometimes I think sometimes it's a theoretical paper or it's a paper with empirical content or it's a modeling paper. It just happens to have unfamiliar methodology. And sometimes, you know, people are a little dismissive of methodologists. And I find that frustrating. On the applied side that you mentioned, so I draw a distinction between, I guess, this kind of basic research where you just take on hard problems because they're hard problems and you feel they're needed to move a field conceptually or theoretically forward. And then I think of applied research as being either once you've solved a hard problem, you then stop and look around and say, could this actually be useful for anything? You know, is there an application of this thing that I just developed in my basic research. Yeah. I don't think I do very much of that. So I'm not applied in that way. I guess there's a different type of applied where people come to you, you know, like there's problems with gambling and they want policy or something like that. And you could take things that are already well known in the scientific literature and say, well, based upon this literature, here would be the way policy should be formed. I guess that's a different sort of applied. And I, I don't do very much of that either. <laughs> I think what I do is there was a paper that summed it up nicely for me. It was, I think it was in the first ever volume of Nature Human Behavior. Behavior. It was a Duncan Watts paper on what he called solution-driven or solution-oriented science. And so mm -hmm. The idea here is that it's neither basic nor applied, but the idea is that you find problems that are real-world problems, but they're hard problems. There is no existing solution in the scientific literature, and you decide you're going to work on them. And you might take them back into the laboratory. You might be three years back in the laboratory, and you might run basic controlled experiments and do all sorts of basic science things. But you're trying to solve this problem that didn't originate out of an academic conference or on a whim or something. It came from a very specific real world problem that needed to be solved. And what appeals to me that is two parts. You know, one is if you solve these problems, you know there's going to be an application. The problem came from the real world. And so if you get a basic science solution, you know what to do with your solution. You know, the problem originated in the real world. Yeah. But I think even deeper than that, I think it forces you to ask scientific questions or rise to scientific challenges that often academia is stuck in a little bit of a rut where we all go to the same conferences over and talk to each other about the same methods and extend them plus epsilon or the same research questions. And I think the real world has a way of generating what the hard and perhaps even the most important problems are that science needs to be addressing. So you know, in my best form, I would like to think of myself who tries to do that sort of solution-driven science. And that means I do interact with industry and outside and real world problems, but I wouldn't call it applied. I'd like to call it solution-driven. Yeah, I like this distinction and also this characterization. I also like the kind of topics you're working on. And personally, if I were to do research, it's typically the kind of things I would like to do and work on. But I find it hard to define. Yeah, as you said, like it's not really applied, but it's not really completely theoretical. So right. it's quite good solution-driven research. I like that. 
So we've established now that you're trying to do this driven research, but something I often ask my guests, especially when they are in research, is how Bayesian stats are used in their field and how Bayesian is their field. So my prior is that Bayesian stats are useful in cognitive sciences because as many people know, you wrote a whole book about it. But can you tell us why? Well, so I think there's kind of multiple answers to that question. I think one is in the context of empirical sciences, at least, and I think of empirical sciences as trying to build descriptions, explanation, predictions of the phenomena that are of interest. So for physicists, that's physical phenomena, and for biologists, it's biological phenomena, and for cognitive scientists, it's cognitive phenomena, or you know, sort of yeah. the phenomena of intelligence. And what you're usually trying to do is build models that describe, explain, and predict that, and you're trying to base your evaluation of them on things that you observe, either in the field or the real world or through controlled experimentation. And so the logic of it is one of, here are some predictions from a model, here are some data, what can we say about the value of the model or parameters within a model conditional upon those data? And that's exactly mm -hmm. the thing the Bayesian framework is set up to address. You know, given these data and given these assumptions, what can we validly conclude? So you know, I don't have a strong opinion about frequentist versus Bayesian in general. You know, as a statistician, there might be great merits to both frameworks. But I think in that empirical science context of making predictions and having observations and conditioning on the observations, Bayes seems like a very natural framework for addressing what an empirical scientist wants to do. And of course, it has the advantage of being carefully axiomatized and, and sort of principled coming from that axiomatization. So you get advantages like you can handle limited data or confidence intervals, which are called credible intervals, now mean what you think they should mean. They yeah, line up with yeah. intuition, or you can find evidence for the null hypothesis, or you can control for model complexity in a principled way. And you know, all of these properties you would like to have come from the Bayesian framework. So that's kind of in the statistical nuts and bolts. I think it kind of provides the answers to the things you want. But something that I try and emphasize is, especially when we teach courses based around the book with my collaborator, E.J. Wagenmarkers in Amsterdam, something that I try and emphasize is that the other big advantage of Bayesian methods for a cognitive scientist is that it gives you the freedom to formalize complicated theoretical ideas. You know, or what you're doing, at least in the Bayesian generative, probabilistic generative modeling approach that I like and use a lot, is proposing a model of how the data got there. You know, there are some parameters that correspond to psychological variables. There's a likelihood function that corresponds to psychological processes. And together they produce data or distributions of data or probabilities over the type of data that you might observe. And then Bayes just conditions upon that and says, okay, you know, what could we say about the parameters and the processes? What values do we think they take? Is this a good set of processes compared to this one? Are these good priors compared to these ones? So it lets you do estimation and selection. But the key was whatever big idea you had, I think that's expressible in the generative model and you will still be able to do inference. You don't have to restrict yourself to proposing theoretical ideas that are the ones for which a frequentist estimator exists or something like that. Yeah. So now, you know, whatever you propose, as long as it's making predictions about data, which is what a scientific model should do, you will be able to do the inference. And this gives you great freedom to propose things that previously you couldn't have proposed within a different statistical framework, but still with the safeguards that it will tell you if you didn't learn much by returning a posterior that's extremely vague, it will penalize you for complexity if your model is too complicated for the data by a base factor preferring a simpler model and so on. So it's not like you can get away with anything, it's just that you can try anything out and evaluate. And I think that theoretical freedom plus the rigor and control that the Bayesian framework provides is exactly what a scientist should want. You know, this frees you up to be as bold as you want to be, but will still tell you when you're doing things well and when you're doing things badly. So we'll still evaluate your creativity in a formal and principled way. And I think for me, that's the really big advantage of the Bayesian framework. Okay, that's a stimulating thought. In a way, if I understand what you're saying is that with Bayesian statistics, you kind of get the whole package in the sense that it allows you to create generative models so you can be creative with the kind of models that you want to create and you don't have to be restrictive to a toolbox of statistical yes, tests. Yes, yes, exactly. And you sometimes get this experience. It's very satisfying when you're talking to people with these real world solution driven problems and you're sitting with 
the expert who understands something very well. And you say, well, how do you think this process works? And they start spelling it out and they say, well, there are probably individual differences. And then you say, that's okay, we can handle that. We'll put a hierarchical distribution on this source. And you don't have to say things like, oh, yeah, but we can't do that because there is no unbiased estimator for this. Or we can't do this because we need at least five data points per cell or, or something like that. You can always just work on a good formalization, a good abstraction of what it is people are spelling out about the theoretical way in which they think these processes work. Yeah, this is really amazing. At the same time, what you said also is that you get also for free all these posterior samples once your model has fit, of course, but all these posterior samples that you can use to ask a lot of questions about your question of interest. And you also get the uncertainty estimates and you also get the handling of uh, missing data. Or uh, That's right. That's right. So I think it tells you everything you do and do not know once you've made these assumptions and yeah. you've got these data and the questions they apply person wants answered like you know is this model better than this one you can say well that will be this base factor or you know we're wondering if this psychological variable ever goes in this range and so we'll be able to see that in the posterior distribution we're wondering if these two things are related that will be a joint posterior distribution you can usually map statistical concepts and the same ones for every project it's not like you're having to make up a new framework you're just consistently applying the very general set of bayesian mechanisms to all of these problems to answer these questions yeah, super interesting. And I could talk about that for hours, but before getting into your work, from what you said there, which really nice introduction of Bayesian methods and why they are useful. Do you know how Bayesian is the field of cognitive science in general? Are you like one of the black sheep or there are a lot of black sheep and in the end they become white? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I'm not sure I can measure things in absolute terms because, you know, nobody is across the entire field of cognitive science. I'm certainly not you know i take samples and they're non-random yeah. samples because i suspect i probably find myself in more bayesian settings you know disproportionately i think what you could say with confidence is that whatever it is now it's much more bayesian than it was five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago it's mm -hmm. clearly growing quickly you know i remember when i started out in the late 90s i guess i did my phd mid 90s and was doing research late 90s you had to explain Bayesian things right from the beginning and you had to hope that it was somebody who was willing to listen to what this thing was at all. This is just a new methodology. I'm not statistic. You know, I don't want to know about this. This is just new yeah. stats or something like that. And I'm happy with the stats I've already learned, at least in the circles in which I move now. You don't have those sorts of problems. I think even people who don't do Bayesian things themselves probably have a sneaking suspicion at the back of their mind that the Bayesian approach is a good approach and something worth valuing and they have some interest in it. So I think it's growing and likely here to stay, I would say. Well, that's good to hear. And actually, do you personally remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods? Good question. So I would have been sort of undergraduate, have done basic Bayesian examples like in the Tversky and Kahneman ignoring base rates and things like mm -hmm. Bayes theorem, but that's not really quite the same thing. It's not the definitional bit of Bayes of putting a probability distribution over the parameter space. So I think that probably came from papers by then in Jay, now Jay Myung and Mark Pitt and colleagues at Ohio State who wrote a number of things. I remember one in memory and cognition, I think in about 97, something like that, that was about Occam's razor. You know, the focus yeah. was initially on controlling for model complexity, balancing up fit and complexity. But as part of doing that, they were bringing whole lots of the Bayesian statistics literature into the cognitive modeling literature. And those papers were very influential for me. And I started doing work like that immediately. In fact, I think it would be fair to say I never did anything non-Bayesian. I might be about as old as you can get in cognitive science where I was, you know, right at the beginning of when Bayes was something you could publish. And I've certainly never been responsible for publishing a p-value. There might be a paper with my name on it where I didn't do the methods bit. I did some other bit that has a p-value, but I've certainly never written one into a manuscript. So it has been possible for at least since the mid-90s to adopt Bayesian methods throughout. That's amazing. And I wonder how rare it is, you know, even across academic fields. I'd be curious about that. Maybe I should do a poll which would be biased with my old guests, you know, former guests. It would be interesting to know both yeah. across fields and across, you know, generations of academics because things like windbugs wasn't a thing you know, jags and stan and pi mc you know these were not things when i started in fact 
the web happened when I was doing my PhD. I remember going into the technical guy saying, what's this HTTP thing that I've just read in a paper? I know what FTP is, but I've never heard of this other one. And he said, oh, ooh, ooh, I've heard about this and got out a trade magazine and we downloaded Cello or one of the first web browsers. Now, I'm also old enough to have coded with punch cards in high school. So, <laughs> so things have changed and then things have got better and computational Bayesian approaches certainly would have been, wouldn't have been possible with punch cards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my God. It's clear that like now the computational that we have even just on our laptop is right. like so great now to do Bayesian computation. And it's true that it goes really hand in hand with this progress in computational power. And by the way, I'm wondering because you're doing these kind of Bayesian models for a while now, and you talked about several frameworks and PPLs, but I'm guessing that you've been doing that for so long now that you are maybe the kind of guy who can like really switch, you know, between any Bayesian framework. So basically my question is what is your favorite technical stack nowadays when you work with Bayesian models? Oh, that's interesting. So I might be about to disappoint you here. <laughs> I, I still use MATLAB. I think from reading Twitter, I think you're meant to be embarrassed to say that you use MATLAB. I'm not sure that I, I'm all that embarrassed. You know, I've become a competent user of it and it lets me do the things I want to do in research. I would like over time to migrate to Python. It's a matter of finding the time. You know, you sit down every yeah. morning and you could either yeah. do this in 10 minutes in MATLAB or in 30 minutes in Python by looking stuff up. And at some point mm -hmm. I'll have to do it that way and learn. But MATLAB was the primary scientific language when I started. It was yeah. heavily used in that defense place because they were all signal processors. Oh, yeah. It's very good at that sort of thing. I still use that routinely day to day. Of course, I use JAGS and progressively more of STAN. And in fact, that's where most of the work is going, sort of. The scientific environment is loading up data and plotting data and things like that. But all of the creative model expression, the sort of generative models that we talked about, that's happening within graphical modeling languages, JAGS and STAN all of the time. And I've become progressively more interested in web people, Noah Goodman, uh, Christian Stuhlmuller one out of Stanford and would like to learn more about that too. All of my students use R, yeah, they're all using R at the moment and it's perfectly fine to collaborate because all of the hard work is being done in developing the graphical model. You know, they're, we're perfectly capable of independently loading data and plotting data ourselves. All of the scientific collaboration happens in the model creation. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I see. Please don't be embarrassed here for using MATLAB. This podcast is a safe space, so... <laughs> so the arguments I see are ones like MATLAB costs money, yeah, which is exactly. true, but in most of society, money indexes value. You know, normally things that are good cost money. That's how it works. Maybe that doesn't apply here. And, and I guess the other one is, I don't think I know anybody who ever actually paid for MATLAB themselves. I guess their institution <laughs> did. Anyway. Maybe we shouldn't say that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I don't mean they hacked it. I mean, it was built into the institutional thing in the same way that they didn't pay yeah. for the carpet on their office floor. Or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess academia would get cheaper if we all used free software completely, but I'm, I'm not sure it wouldn't just be in the noise, given the money that universities and academia spends on infrastructure. Yeah, that's interesting. I think one of the main arguments for free software like R, Python, Stan, etc. is more on democratization of science and also reproducibility of analysis and so on. I think those are both fair arguments. So, yeah. Anyway, that's a super interesting topic, but <laughs> I want to ask you now more about what you do in your research because time goes by. So something I'd like you to do for us is if you can walk us through an example of a nice Bayesian model that you used in your work and that shows us how cognitive science can be helpful. So for instance, you don't have to take this example by the way, but it's just a personal curiosity of mine because I work a lot on multinomial models mainly for election forecasting mm -hmm. because in France it's not at all like in the US so we have a lot of parties and these political parties tend to change a lot with time so 
you have to use multinomial models and, and it's super interesting. These are quite complicated models because you have a lot of dimensions, especially right. when you go into hierarchical models, but it's also why they are super interesting. And I saw that you recently worked on multinomial processing tree models to understand memory impairment. So I was curious about that because I don't even know what is a processing tree model. So you can talk about that, but you can also pick an, another example. Okay. Yeah, I know the bit of work you're talking about. I've become progressively more interested in multinomial processing tree models. The idea there is that you really just try and break cognitive process up into a, a tree that has some simple probabilistic steps, you know, that the person either remembered or didn't remember the item and given that they remembered it, did they execute the recall of it correctly? And so you just have these mm -hmm. sequences of probabilities in a tree that end up at observed behavior and you yeah. try and dissect the observed behavior into these constituent generating probabilities. So yeah, I know the work you mean it but that one was a little bit complicated, though. I think a better one to talk about, maybe staying with the memory impairment. So this is a nice example of the real world solution driven science is have a collaboration with Alzheimer's Clinic and an informatics startup built around it called the Medical Care Corporation. So they're interested in describing and explaining and predicting people's memory impairment. And they have all of these clinical data. You know, these are the testing data that people use. And so the project you're talking about was part of understanding the sort of free recall decline in performance that happens using cognitive models. But maybe a more fun one to talk about is one that was to do with semantic memory that I'm working on right now. So this is with my second year graduate student, Holly Westfall. I guess she's almost in her third year. So this is as part of the testing batteries that people do when they go to Alzheimer's clinics, or at least in some of the testing batteries, they test semantic memory using what's called a triadic comparison or an odd one out task. So this is just like Sesame Street. It's like which one of these three things is not like the other one you get given cow and elephant and giraffe and you have to say which one is the odd one out of those three. Mm -hmm. it's assessing something about how people judge the similarities or the semantics between the natural kind of animal given by these animal names and they observe that performance changes in this as people become more impaired they have people who are healthy that they're like the caregivers who come in they have people who have very mild cognitive impairment they have people who have moderate they have people who have very severe cognitive impairment where they're now um, you know not just forgetting their meetings or complicated tasks but they're forgetting to bathe or to dress appropriately and so you know a whole spectrum of cognitive impairment and the question is what changes in your semantic memory what changes in your semantic representation with impairment, what is going on. And so where Bayes was useful is we went through the literature and it seemed like there are kind of three competing hypotheses for what might be going on. One is that people fundamentally change their representation so that they no longer think about some features that they used to think about when they were cognitively healthy. That's some sort of representational restructuring. Another hypothesis was that it's not that the features go away, it's just they attend to different features more so that when you're cognitively healthy, abstract things like this animal can swim or this animal's a pet or this animal is African or something, they're important to you. But as you become more impaired, you just focus on the physical features like this is big or this has spots or something like that. And by that hypothesis, it's the change in what features you're attending to that mean you give different choices. And then a third one is just nothing changes about your representation, you just have trouble accessing it. And so your performance becomes more random over time, noisier mm -hmm. over time. So the medical care corporation people in the field of Alzheimer's in general would like to understand this because if you're going to use these tests to understand the impacts of Alzheimer's and related yeah. disorders on memory, or if you want to use them as early predictors of what's going to happen, you know, that if people are starting to behave in this way, this is a sign that these things are going wrong with mm -hmm. their semantic memory. So you want to understand what is it that changes about memory, you know, which one of those three big hypotheses is the right way to think about it so that you can use the data usefully in a clinical context. And so the big advantage of Bayesian methods, which we kind of touched on before, is the theoretical freedom to propose models that correspond to those hypotheses. So the way Holly and I set it up is in the representational restructuring. We now have a latent mixture model that says of all of these candidate features, here are the features people are using at this stage of impairment, and then a measurement of whether those features are flipping on or off as you progress through the impairment. What's the rate at which the underlying features are changing and that people are fundamentally representing animals differently? And then you can get a Bayes factor that says what's the probability that rate is zero or that rate is high and so on. Uh, for the attention change, you can have this order-constrained hypothesis that the attention 
attention to physical is going up while the attention to abstract is going down. So you have a natural expression in terms of the slopes of some regressed parameters. So just like we were talking about before, you can map these big theoretical ideas very concretely onto base factors of order restricted hypotheses, for example, and, and get an answer to the question. And for the noise one, you can put a parameter in the choice rule that says as this parameter goes high, people execute very accurately. And as this parameter goes down, they start to behave more and more noisily, approaching complete randomness. So a base factor again for is that parameter changing over the fast stages? And so the big advantage of the Bayesian framework is we can set up these generative models that co correspond to these quite complicated theoretical ideas. And then, as you said, apply them to data, including missing data. Of course, these are real world data from a clinic where people don't turn up for every testing session and miss some trials and have a complicated structure. And there's nothing neat. Some people been tested 30 times and some people have been tested once and they were aging as they tested and they changed stage. So you can account for all of those sorts of complications, but come up with a basic answer to the question. By the way, we think the answer is the last one, which is the most boring one. We think the representation itself probably doesn't change. We think that people just have trouble accessing, but it's an answer to the question built by formalizing these theoretical ideas into generative models and using the Bayesian framework to evaluate them and compare them against each other. This is fascinating work. And on that, I think I have two questions. First, this sounds like super complicated models because, well, human behavior is very complicated. So I'm wondering how many months or years did you guys spend on such project? And was the time mainly eaten by the modeling part or by the data collection part? What was the main difficulty? Well, so the data came to us for free. I think this is one thing that often happens in this solution-driven mm. approach. You know, they already have the clinical data. They're sitting there. They're real-world data that they've been collecting for decades. You know, So it's a rich data source. You kind of look at it and think, if we can't understand something about semantic memory from these data, then there's a problem, right? There must be something to be learned here. On the modeling front, I think that's an interesting question. So the goal is not to emulate the complication. Whatever is really going on is, as you say, extremely complicated and subject to all sorts of things that we haven't captured in our models. Yeah. But models aren't meant to be emulations. They're meant to be models, right? You know, it's not like we're trying to build a ship in the same way that a, you know, a, a ship inside a glass bottle is a model of a ship. It's not a ship itself that you can sail. So it's useful for some purposes, like you know, to appreciate the aesthetics of ships. Yeah. So we were really trying to build models that distilled the essence of those competing theories. And that's not trivial, but they're also not super complicated. I wouldn't call them Baroque or Labyrinthine or anything once they're developed. They're tractable models that try and get at the heart of what those different scientific theories are expressing. So, you know, the essence of the one where you change your representation is we've got some assumptions that people use features to represent animals. Is that subset of features changing as people progress through these impairment stages? And that's a question you can formulate fairly precisely. I'm sure it's missing a million things in the detail of exactly how they're used, yeah. but you're seeing whether you can do that. For the attention change one, it's really just an ordinal prediction. Physical should go up. We don't say exactly how it should go up, but it should go up and abstract should go down in terms of the level of attention. Is that happening or not? And again, these are not perfect. Of course, we check descriptive adequacy and all of those sorts of things to show that these provide a reasonable descriptive account of the data but they're not attempting to be emulations. They're attempting to be abstractions or caricatures of the essence of the theoretical assumptions that are being tested. And so most of the work goes into making things simpler rather than more complicated in that way. You know, you could always imagine adding more and more layers to your model to try and account for everything that could possibly be going on. But I think the challenge is to pair all of that back and find what the simplest adequate expression of the theoretical idea you're testing. Yeah, but often it's hard to simplify things. <laughs> Much harder than complicating them. You know, you hear this from academics sometimes when they have to contribute to these handbook chapters or encyclopedia entries, you know, where you've got a 700 word limit and people will send things in saying, oh, sorry, I'm three months late. I could have been much quicker if I'd had more words to write. You know, the challenge was not in saying what you wanted to say. The challenge was in saying it succinctly and getting to the essence yeah. of it. So yeah, most of the conversations Holly and I have had haven't been about things that we hadn't thought about that we needed to add, they've been about, is this the best way in which we can express this? Yeah. 
almost all creative endeavors are like this, right? People who can get at the essence of things. Guitar solos that put in every trick the guitarist knows in every single solo often get really boring really quickly. The ones who find the fewest notes with the right spaces to get exactly the right aesthetic are the impressive solos. Yeah, in a sense, yeah, you want like minimal working model. Yes, like, yes, yeah. exactly like a stack exchange example, right? The ones that are the most useful to the community are the ones that get at the heart of the problem that the person is asking, not a cut mm -hmm. and paste of all of their code that nobody else can parse because they don't know what problem the person's working on. Yeah, it reminds me also of like, you don't want to overfit, but you don't want to underfit either. So you have to navigate yes. these two dimensions at yeah, the same really time. It's really an essence of Occam's razor, you know, it's as simple as possible, but not simpler. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nice way to conclude this question. Maybe before um, going to another example, I'm wondering whether you had one big difficulty that you encountered with this multinomial tree model or the project in general. Like, you know, did you encounter something that made you bang your head against the wall for weeks? I don't hope so, but maybe <laughs> months. Well, I think every scientist has experienced this at multiple levels. So it can be anything from, you know, the trivial coding error that somehow you didn't spot over and over again but once you insert the square bracket i close square bracket it all suddenly works and of course it does and why didn't you spot that earlier so the most abstract theoretical ones of why didn't i ever think about this in terms of signal detection theory or in terms of multinomial processing trees because from that perspective it's kind of straightforward to see how to make progress so you know i think science is a creative activity and part of the definition of a job of a researcher is permanently to be slightly confused that's kind of mm -hmm. your job if mm -hmm. you're not struggling with it then you're not contributing to knowledge and pushing boundaries which is exactly your job description and so if ever it gets comfortable you're probably doing the wrong thing so i think we're all there all of the time <laughs> as we should be <laughs> yeah i completely agree but i don't know how you turn that into a job ad you know like expect <laughs> to be confused all the time do you like not quite knowing what you're doing you know <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, right. if you feel comfortable and think you know what you're doing maybe you're not made to be a scientist you know <laughs> yeah I, i guess it applies to some other places a little bit so i'm not a fan of Baseball, being Australian, I'm a big cricket fan, and I think baseball is really kind of pointless. Um, <laughs> I've never met anybody who understands both baseball and cricket and actually prefers <laughs> baseball. I've, I've tried. I've never met such a person. But I believe in baseball. The idea is you should be getting thrown out at base stealing some proportion of the time, right? If you're safely sitting on first base, you're probably mm -hmm. missing a bunch of opportunities that you should yeah. sometimes be thrown out. So there should be that tension of finding where the boundary is on your risk taking within a context like that in cricket you should be run out every now and then for people who appreciate cricket so maybe at least some i don't know whether competitive is the right frame but boundary pushing endeavors there should yeah, be yeah. some non-trivial failure rate to signify i think you're doing the right thing yeah yeah okay i think i understood your comparison because and i'm gonna put that in context apparently you never met someone who understood both baseball and cricket But you have in front of you someone who understands neither baseball nor <laughs> cricket. So, <laughs> well, that's an easier model. That's a coin flip, probably. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Or some base that's rate. good. Yeah. But no, I think in what you're saying, and actually, as a European, I have a football analogy for that. You know, so it's okay. What would that be? You got to share it now. Yeah, well, so I live in Paris and Paris has this super big football club, which is like crushing the championship everywhere, but to a point where it becomes, you know, boring mm -hmm. to follow the French championship because you already know that Paris is going to be the champion at the end of the year. So basically the most interesting games when you're a Parisian supporter is the games at the European level, which is mm -hmm. the Champions League games. Well, first PSG is quite a young club, so it's a confounding fact in my analysis, but put that aside. One of the theories that people have to explain that PSG have some difficulties in the Champions League regularly is that actually the fact of being not challenged in the national championship is a handicap for them in the European League because they are not used, you know, to being challenged during games and th so they are not used yes. to up their game, you yes. know. Yes, yes, you have no experience of being in a close competitive game, which is exactly what you need in the European championships. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's good. I understood your baseball analogy then. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I, I can move to the US now. 
<laughs> I have everything I need. <laughs> okay, so let's turn actually now to another paper of yours that I found really interesting. The goal was to understand the complexity of simple decisions and how people switch strategies. So what can you tell us about that? You know, what is a simple decision and how do people switch their strategies in this context? Yeah, I think this is an interesting project and ongoing work. This is with Kevin Gluck and his team at the Air Force Research Laboratories in Dayton, Ohio. So this is another example of solution driven. And I think that they assume that operators in different military settings are using fairly simple heuristics to make decisions. Examples might be like things we call take the best in cognitive psychology, where you look for one good reason to prefer an option over another one, or very simple tallying strategies where you have the pros and the cons, but you just give them all equal weight and say, this one has three advantages and this one only has two advantages. So I'll pick the one with three. And then there might be more complicated ones where you start to weigh the various properties, you know, I, I care more about this feature than that feature, so it counts twice or something like that. And I guess the possibility is that people might switch between these depending upon the properties of the environment, but also depending upon the consequences of their decision and errors that they might make. And that people might mm -hmm. be, and maybe they, well, it could go both ways. They might start off with a simple strategy and doesn't seem to work so well. So they go to something that evaluates more of the information and weight things. But the other way around seems just as plausible where you start by doing it very carefully. And then you realize that actually there's a shortcut here and we could just look at these features and that would be enough. And there wouldn't even be an error signal involved in that. You know, you'd be completely accurate the whole way through. It's just you change strategy because you can save the time and energy costs in doing it. So they were interested in when and how people switch between strategies like those sorts of ones in real world operational tactical environments and strategic environments too, I guess. And so really the work we've done there was to try and build, again, this is the pushing back to the methodology. Like that's the big psychological question. What are the methods for evaluating strategy switches? I don't think there are so many of them. You know, psychology is focused on incremental learning type models, reinforcement learning and things like this, where you gradually update what you know. And I guess one of the reasons for doing that is that's all continuous math and derivatives. And you can do those sorts of things with 17 century technology, you know, but switching is a different sort of mathematics and a different sort of computation. And you really need the computational machinery that we now have to study it. So it's probably running behind. It hasn't been investigated as much. So we tried to do some work developing models based upon Bayesian, bring stuff in from Bayesian statistics again. So it's spike and slab priors that give the possibility of detecting change points in cognition. And the idea would be that would correspond to something like a change point in the strategy that somebody was using. So you could now measure it. Yeah. And I guess our idea was you have to be able to measure these things before you can have theories and conclusions and applications. And I guess the second part we're doing, Kevin is especially motivated to think about verbal report. I think he's a fan of, of course, verbal reports have a troubled history in psychology with introspection, but I think there is value. I think he's right that there's value in them. So he was interested in bringing in multiple sources of behavioral data sort of to triangulate these change points. It's not just changes in the decisions people are making, but changes in the search strategy they're going through to make the decisions, changes in what they're self-reporting as they go through making the decisions. And you can set that up in a Bayesian framework where the same generative model is generating multiple sources of behavioral data, you know, decisions, mm -hmm. searches, verbal reports. And this gives you sort of extra information to get more confident or the ability to detect when there are underlying changes in the strategy. So we have a fairly recent paper in decision that tries to unpack all of that and work through all of that. I think it's an interesting area. Yeah, that sounds really fascinating. So I'm wondering what's the end game of this sort of models? You know, where would you see this kind of model being applicable? You know, in which situation? Yeah, so there's multiple possibilities, I guess. One would be if you got a model that was good enough at doing what a person did, then you've got some sort of artificial intelligence and you can now automate the human-like decision-making process, which means you can do it you know, efficiently with perfect motivation and so on. But you could also imagine applications in training so that if you can do inference on a particular operator's decision history, you know, you've sort of measured what they've been doing and they're imperfect and there are some errors and there's some sub -optimality and their performance, rather than just saying, you're only getting it 93% right, do better or something like that. You could now try and unpack it in cognitively interpretable terms and say something like, 
you seem to be switching strategy after about 20 trials when you're in this sort of environment, but that's triggering the errors and give some sort of input into a meaningful training process that could lead to the improvement of performance. Yeah, that's indeed very interesting and has a lot of potential. So I'd be very curious to see this kind of applied to this kind of situation, honestly. Please tell me when you do that and you come back on the podcast. <laughs> right. Will do. I'll make a note. <laughs> As you say, your work involves building a lot of tailored models, you know, post hoc models. So I'm wondering if you nonetheless see common difficulties that you encounter with your cognitive science models and your data. And I'm wondering also, how do you usually solve them? So I think I'm a very incremental sort of scientist, you know, but just my basic disposition, I'm not one of those big idea people. I don't have some grand vision of how the mind works or, or something mm. like that. I much prefer, and I think I'm better at working in this solution-driven thing that we've talked about with almost bespoke or tailored cognitive models for particular circumstances, sort of moving from project to project. I think I'm also incremental in the way I go about that sort of work. So, you know, the first thing would be usually to get my head around the data and to do a bunch of plots of the data relevant to the question. So it's not that theoretical thinking hasn't come in already because what you choose to plot is already imposing some sort of theoretical framework, but it's just the data. There's no model in there yet. And I would like to get a feel for the regularities and the variability in the data first. And then the first model would always be way too simple, but check that everything's working and making contact with the data and it's going to be massively incomplete and disappointing and not complicated enough, but it's heading in the right direction and then to kind of add these layers of complexity. So as we were talking about earlier, you know, it's this balance of, of finding the simplest complete model. And I think I tend to start at the simple end and go in baby steps upwards until I hit a point where I feel like this is now a complete enough understanding. And if I pushed further, either I'm overcomplicating it or I'm starting to open up the scope of questions that weren't the original questions or something like that. I don't think that's the only way to do things. It's the one I like the best and suits me. I don't like it when everything stops working. You have no idea why I'd like to proceed in incremental steps and build up to something that seems satisfactory and complete yeah. enough. Yeah, but it seems I'm not surprised by your answer in the sense that you're someone who is very experienced in building Bayesian models. So your advice and your workflow actually echoes uh, advice a lot of people gave on this podcast, which is don't start with the most complicated model. Start with the most simple model and then you build up because you can start by the most complicated one, but it won't sample and you won't know why. And you will spend a lot of hours trying to understand why. Yeah, I think students often feel a need that they have to do something really complicated and impressive even to be a, you know, for anybody to take notice or be a player. And I think that's a mistake. I think they miscalibrate how much you achieve to have done something useful. It's nice that you have all of these ideas in this big wide ranging discussion we had. Now, what's the very simplest thing you could start would be the first step towards realizing all of those big ideas we just talked about. Yeah, yeah exactly. Also, yeah, relates to what Andrew Gelman said when he came on the show for episode 20, which was like something like regression is awesome and you can do a lot of things with just regression. So right. try that and then you'll see in the end, of course, you'll have to find something. You try to have the simplest model possible, but the reality is so complicated that the simplest model possible is always a bit more complicated than what you would have wished. Right. But start with the simple model with the simple regression and then you'll build up from there. Right, I think I agree with that. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask you if you have like a favorite model or favorite method, you know, like one that you're always happy to use and can share with us because you've done so many models that I'm wondering whether you have, you know, one favorite. Yeah, I don't know that I have one favorite. I think one thing that I find myself repeatedly doing, you know, so one thing that comes into play in many projects is I've always been interested in individual differences, which seemed a little ignored to me in, in at least some mm -hmm. subfields of cognitive modeling. Of course, it's important to find where people are invariant, you know, what makes us identical and the same, you know, what are the fundamental properties of intelligence and cognition. But there's also variability and that is equally interesting, I would say, you know, that's the whole field of psychometrics and cognitive ability and testing and so on. 
So using hierarchical and latent mixture structures within the Bayesian framework to accommodate individual differences is something that I find myself doing over and over again. And it's not rocket science, but I think it's very satisfying and very useful. You know, the idea is sometimes individual variability might be continuous, you know, sort of people's changes in IQ or something follows some continuous yeah. distribution and that's nicely captured, or nicely modeled by hierarchical extensions. But sometimes there are qualitative rather than sort of small quantitative differences. So some people use one strategy and other people use another strategy. And I think they're often well captured by mixture models and usually latent mixture models because you don't know who's using what strategy. And the combination of those two together, I think, provides a pretty simple but kind of impressively complete for the simplicity of the concept framework for accommodating individual differences in whatever cognitive process or cognitive science problem that you might be dealing with. So, you know, that's one I'm always keen for my students to understand well and be able to implement in a moment if and when it becomes relevant in a project that they're working on. Yeah, I agree. I love hierarchical models. It's awesome. These are among my favorites too. I love that. Another question I had for you before closing up, it's a super broad question, but since you're working in cognitive science and I had Daniel Lackens in episode 18, and we talked among other things about the reproducibility crisis more in the psychology field, but cognitive science, I guess, also is aware of this issue. So I'm wondering where do you think the field of cognitive science is in that regard? It's an interesting question. So my colleague Joachim van der Kirchhoff and I, but mostly Joachim, organized a workshop that the NSF funded on pretty much exactly this topic in Florida mm. a couple of years ago. And it was exactly as you framed it. It was, there's this crisis of confidence sort of in empirical psychology. Are there any lessons for the cognitive modeling part of cognitive science or yeah. cognitive psychology? I guess under that, it's that saying sort of never let a good crisis go to waste. I think it's yeah. sometimes attributed to Rahm Emanuel. So we had a week with a whole bunch of people thinking through, are there any morals or lessons or imperatives for us coming out of this? And I mean, we generated more questions and thoughts than we generated answers. I'm not sure there are clear answers, but some stuff is obvious. So things like curated code and data for reproducibility and things like that would be obvious things we should be doing and would be very consistent with the reaction to the crisis of confidence. We thought about things like pre-registered modeling reports where you say exactly what models you're going to test and how you're going to evaluate those models so you can't change the players in the game or the rules for evaluating the players in the game when you come to publication. I guess in general, what it made us think about is putting at least some emphasis on confirmatory approaches in cognitive modeling and not solely on exploratory. We published this in Computational Brain and Behavior and then generated a whole lot of comments. It ended up almost like a behavioral and brain sciences volume with a target article and a million people commenting. And kind of one of the themes of the comments was people getting a little bit upset that we were taking away exploratory science, which is absolutely not what we were trying to do, as we've talked about today. Um, I think the creative development of things and looking at the data for inspiration to try and understand cognitive processes, this is absolutely fundamental to science. This is 99% of what I do and I think what many cognitive scientists do and it's the cornerstone of the field. But I think there is some value in confirmatory approaches where you lock all of this stuff in, especially when you think about the applied or solution-driven or real-world type stuff. So, you know, we're all going through COVID at the moment. We're all waiting for these vaccines in clinical trials. And those trials are very constrained to make sure there's no wriggle room, you know, that when the thing comes through, it's uh, safe and effective. And I think yeah. there's some merit to that. If we wanted all of our cognitive modeling and cognitive science theories and models to be valuable to the real world, at some point, at least in some cases, we probably need to lock them down and do a genuine test. Say so we're going to install this code on this system and it will be successful if it, you know, let's say it's the Netflix recommendation system or something. So it has to predict how many stars you're going to give to this movie within this level of accuracy for this many movies from this many people. And we're not allowed to tinker with the model as the data come in. You know, this is a confirmatory test of the model to see if it's fit for some sort of applied purpose. And that would come naturally out of the kind of reaction experimental psychology is having with their registered reports and with the replications and so on. You get another lab to check that it worked on their Netflix system as well or something like that. I do think there are some opportunities there for us to do new and different things without tearing down the way cognitive modeling works at the moment. Yeah, 
my reaction to um, pre-registration of models is like, I don't know how you do that because as you said, it's an inherently iterative workflow. So now you have some idea at the beginning of the analysis of what you're going to try, but during the analysis, you get so many more ideas for uh, to test other models that I'd be afraid, you know, to shut down this kind of creativity by doing that. But it's just my first reaction. Well, so I think that's right. And it, your reaction is pretty much like the one we got to the paper. So we don't disagree with any of that, I don't think. The idea would be that after some very large period of exploration, there might come a point in some circumstances in which you wanted to lock things in to prove that it was fit for some sort of purpose. You know, yeah, I see. I think the drug development analogy is a reasonable one. You know, presumably there's enormous exploration and creativity in proposing the vaccine, but the final test of the vaccine pre-registers and double blinds yeah. and, and all of this sort of stuff. And th there's a reason that they do that. You know, it's not just because they want to hold things up for six months or they like putting injections yeah. into people, including half the people getting placebo or whatever. They do it for a good reason. And the interesting thing to think about are there circumstances like that for the sort of yeah. creative things that we produce in terms of their real world or other use. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. And this is indeed very interesting. Like you can say uh, when you are in phase one or phase two of your project, it's okay. You don't have to pre-register. But when you get to phase three, which is like industrialization of your vaccine, yes. yeah, but here of your model, then you have to pre-register to finish this phase. And I wouldn't tell anybody that once phase three is done, you're never allowed to work on it again. You can drag it back into phase one if you want. You know, you learned even more things in the trial and now you can develop a new one. That's fine. It's just... That, that confirmatory has some scientific evaluative content that you get from confirmatory that you don't get from exploratory. And it's important to understand that. I think that's the big lesson. Well, I don't follow the experimental psychology literature close enough to be 100% sure. But I think that's one of the lessons that they're learning there. That it's kind of possible to fool yourself if everything remains exploratory and that there's real benefit in pre-registering and attempting to reproduce because surprising stuff happens. And, you know, that means you're learning more by adopting those sorts of methods and learning more is the goal. So it's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. As you say, super interesting stuff. Do you have something written about that, by the way, that we could put in the show notes for people? Because I think it's a very interesting topic and, and people like to hear yeah. about this. So that issue of the Journal of Computational Brain and Behavior would be the right one. It has our original target article. It has, you know, how many, 20 commentaries. And then it has our reply and synthesis and integration of those commentaries. So yeah, I'll provide you with that link. And that would also alert, alert people to that journal. That's a relatively new journal, but I think a, a really excellent journal for people who are interested in computational cognitive science. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, please send me the link and I'll put that in the show notes because it's super interesting. Maybe one last quick question before the last two questions, which would be more, you know, broader and more about you and your project. Basically, which projects are you most excited about for the coming month? For the coming month? Oh, what a good question. So the one that I talked about earlier with Holly, with the tragic comparison of animals and the different possibilities for memory impairment is one that we're writing up right now. And, and I'm very enthusiastic about that. Um, working on something to do with, have a collaboration with a company called Ranker that a lot of people haven't heard of, but I think it's the 34th biggest website in the world or something like that, according to Quantcast. It's the one that anytime you type into Google and Google gives you back the authoritative ranking list, they've dragged it from Ranker. It's a big crowdsourced opinion site where people rank against fairly specific, often pop culture questions, you know, the top 10 flavors of jelly beans or oh, the, yeah. the three worst rap songs of 1993 or something like that. So, you know, those data are kind of rich psychological data to explore, I think, and naturally occurring data, which I always, you know, I often feel like naturally occurring data capture things better than laboratory data does because they occur naturally. It's just people doing whatever they do. And so we're looking at context and framing effects in that. So, for example, there's one list on best NBA basketball players of all time, and there's another list of best European basketballers in the NBA of all time. So one is just a subset of the other, right? You know, within yeah. the all players, there are the European players. But an interesting psychological question would be, do people change the order in which they rank or evaluate players depending upon the context or the framing 
of the question. And of course, there's a big psychological literature on this, but it's mostly laboratory data and maybe people think you're playing some game with them and they're meant to reverse it because you asked the different question. Yeah, yeah. But that's not true in the naturally occurring. So we're doing this big exploration of can we find context and framing effects in this naturally occurring data source? So this isn't especially Bayesian and this doesn't even have a cognitive model in it. So <laughs> it's not perfect for this interview, but it's an example of a naturally occurring data and something that I'm currently motivated to pursue through. Yeah. No, that's a very exciting project. So it fits the question. It's very good. <laughs> okay, so our time is up now, Michael. So I'm going to let you go. But before that, I have to ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So the first one is if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I knew this was coming. I think the thing that I'm most interested in that I regard as sort of a big hard problem would be I've had a long-standing interest in the wisdom of the crowd and especially applying cognitive models to the wisdom of the crowd. You know, the idea mm -hmm. that we can aggregate together individual opinions to reach a group opinion or decision that somehow is well performed. So that's partly a cognitive modeling problem because it's about how people produce opinions or decisions. And it's certainly about individual differences. That's the whole point that different people know or say different things or have different biases that you can aggregate over. But I think there's a big social or social cognition element in it as well, oftentimes, where people know what other people think about things or what they're deciding. And I would like to understand how those things interact. So, for example, when people make predictions about the outcomes of sporting events or something, you know, all the media experts line up to say who's going to win this week's football game. If they all pick one team, there are kind of, in caricature, two extreme possibilities. One is that team is Paris Saint-Germain. So it's, you know, it's much stronger than whoever they're playing in League One, isn't it? Yeah. So they're much stronger and it's kind of the ground truth and they probably are going to win. So, you know, a unanimous vote would signal that. But another possibility is that one authoritative person, you know, the main person said that and everybody else just copied them. You know, they got into some sort of group think because they were socially aware that this is the consensus decision. And in that case, maybe they're not going to win. You know, maybe it's a coin toss, mm -hmm. but the surface data are identical. And so the problem of telling apart or understanding how people's predictions or decisions arrive through their cognitive processes, individual differences in those processes and the social cognitive environment and context in which those processes are made, including the payoffs and utilities, that seems like a really challenging, hard, multifaceted problem, but one that would tell us a lot about intelligent systems. And now we don't just mean people, we mean collections of people who tell us about collective intelligence and would also be you know, extremely useful and all sorts of naturally occurring data and real world problems that could be applied to this, but a big undertaking, which is what you asked for. Yeah, but definitely fascinating indeed. I would love to read about that and understand better these kind of processes. Like it's really super interesting. Okay. The second question now is if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? Yeah, I didn't know what fictional meant in this, but maybe that's just my lack of imagination. So I thought about this along a little bit. I think my answer is E.T. Jaynes, Edwin Jaynes, the author of Probability Theory, The Logic of Science. That is one book that I've read cover to cover more than once and has been enormously influential on the way I think about Bayesian statistics, but about science in general. I think The Logic of Science bit as the subtitle, I think, I don't know that I agree with absolutely every last bit of it, but an enormously influential book. And then because of the dinner bit, I personally like his sense of humor. I understand that not everybody might. He has a kind of acerbic wit that I find extremely appealing. And I think it would be an interesting and a fun dinner. And I think I'd learn a lot. Yeah, yeah definitely super good choice. And I think because E.T. James comes up a lot on the podcast, but I'm not sure, but I think you're the first one to mention him for dinner. So very okay. good. Yeah, really good. Well, Michael, thank you very much. It was really super interesting talking about cognitive sciences. I really love this field. I learned a lot. I hope our listeners did too. And it's great to hear that patient models are helpful in researching such uh, fascinating topics. So as usual, I'll put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Michael, for taking the time and being on this show. Well, thank you, Alex. I really appreciate you inviting me and I appreciate the podcast and all the work you do and kind of popularizing or making available all of these ideas. And we should thank Chelsea for connecting us in the first place. <laughs> yeah. well. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Thanks a lot, Chelsea, for connecting Michael and I. And thanks for this scan where, Michael, it's 
the best feedback I could ever have. So thanks and take care. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a... Good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good busy. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.